Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I, uh, I have quite a bit to say to you today. I, uh, two or three Sundays ago, I, I reminded you all that the whole business of Hinduism and, and on yoga and all that kind of stuff has been revived, if you will, uh, ever since the 60s, really. It came in big onslaughts and big, you know, you hear of ISIS, you know, taking over town and they go there and they send all their guns and that's what Hinduism did by a planned plan or with a planned plan. Uh, there is a plan to destroy Christianity in the West. That's what it is. It's, it's not here to destroy any other belief system, only Christianity. And I wonder why that would be. Well, it's because Christ is the truth. Hallelujah. I titled today's Mindless Meditation. Uh, you know, they these Indians and others, Hindu people, have succeeded in duping the public at large, and therefore many who call themselves Christians that participating in any of these things that they push and and advance to any to any degree or to the degree in which we participate, uh, it's a harmful thing. But they say, no, it teaches you to get in deeper touch with your inner self. Well, how many of you know your inner self? How many of you know that who you are is who you are? You are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. And if you're going to, you know, it's, I've said this before, if you're going to find out if you want to fix a Corvette, you can't go to a Ford uh, fix-it book. You got to go to a Chevy book because the, the, they're, they're the guys who make the the Corvette, and and so you go to the designer. God is a designer of you and me and everything we see, and that's where we go to. Uh, but Satan, of course, has another plan, and his plan is always deception. Uh, you know, the Bible does promise us that we know our deeper selves too, in a way, and not in the silly way of the cults and, and false teachings. But in a real way, because the life that you and I, the, the fact that I walked from the, you know, like this, there's life in me. People want to say that life is made up of all these parts and then they want to add them together. But the point is you can have a dead mosquito with all its parts, but it's still dead because there's no life. You and I can have a heart, the lungs, the bone system, the skeletal thing, you know, the, all the skin, all the veins even blood in our system. But when the life goes, you're done. So everything that makes your physical you can be in place, but that's not you. That's why you're a spirit. Words are spirit, Jesus said. My words are spirit and they are life. Wow. <coughs> well, God's word is rejected because it's antiquated. But it's funny that Eastern religions are accepted because they're antiquated. The Word of God is rejected because of antiquation, supposedly, and the Eastern religions are accepted because of the very same thing. Well, the wise old sages, you know, guy with the long beard sitting in a cave hundreds of years ago, he's wise, you know. And yet, when we say, well, God wrote the Bible, you know, uh, 2,500 years ago, he had his guys write the Bible, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Oh no, that's just too old, it's outdated. We don't want to do that today, we're modern. You see, the, the, there's no sense in that anyway. But that's what they argue. And, uh, you know, intelligent people argue this. Of course, one of the many hurdles that they cite is John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The whole claim of exclusivity by Christ is, I am it, there's nobody else is the problem. And I, for the life of me, can't find out or haven't found out to this point why anyone would want to have more than one. If there's going to be the truth as an absolute truth, then there cannot be many. Because the fact is two opposing views cannot simultaneously be right. One has to be wrong. And if you have three or four or more of those views, they have a problem. Only one can be right. They cannot all be right. And yet that's exactly what the world teaches. Satan has told the world, these smart, intelligent PhDs, etc., that, oh no, all these things together have a little bit 
and then we get the whole truth by all these little things together, yet all of them are fighting with one another too in the sense that, uh, you know, there's no cohesion between any of the false belief systems. The only cohesion we have is in the Word of God. Hallelujah. As long as the devil has you thinking that can't be just one way, uh, you've got a problem. He teaches that it's like a grocery store shelf, you know. All these products are on these shelves, and it's all food. And you can get some cereal, and you can get some cheese, and you can get some milk, and you can get some hot dogs, and you can get whatever else, some potato chips. It's all food. And as we know today, from a real grocery store, most of it is actually trash, isn't it? <laughs> all this diversity, all these things, getting away from the basics of nourishment even. So that concept does not hold water. Either there is truth or there is no truth. And tr Jesus said he was the truth, or rather he is the truth. None of these separate ways on this grocery shelf demand accountability from the individual. If you don't want to eat the cheese today, if you want to eat the chips instead, that's fine. If you want to eat the pork chop instead of the, you know, the side of beef, that's fine. It's all food, they say. No accountability. No living together in unity. And none make you happy, even though you may partake of all of them. The fact remains, two opposing views cannot simultaneously be right. Doctrinally speaking, Islam is not in agreement with the Roman Catholic Church. They have a lot of similarities. They are brother-sister religions, but doctrinally they do not agree. Mormonism does not agree with the Roman Catholics or with the Jehovah's Witness or with Islam. Lutherism doesn't agree with the Southern Baptists or the Baha'is. You understand what I'm saying? Yet they all are getting together like they're together. And they're not together. Except in this one thing. They all agree in their hatred of the God of the Bible. The Lord Jesus who is the truth. Unless there's one truth wholly and separated from all the rest, it would be perverted. We've talked many times about a little leaven leavens the whole bunch. That's the whole point of that teaching. One little speck of dark on a white sheet makes the sheet no longer white. No matter how small it is, it could be something you can't even see without an electron microscope. But as long as you know it's there, that thing is not white. And so it can only be one. And that one has to be unchanging, which God is. He is immutable. He changes not. And the biggest teaching of meditation is that you get into yourself, you hum a few tunes or, you know, you... You do a mantra which is repeating either a name or a phrase or something like that. And if you do it enough times, you're going to get in touch with your inner self. That's the actual literal teaching. That itself is idiotic. They say that they can do this without drugs or any other human, you know, it frees human problems from stress, anxiety, and depression. The truth is it adds to these things and actually causes these things. And now, in you know, 2015, 16 and onward, uh, it's been proven more and more that Eastern meditation has people in now clinics wanting to undo what they did for years. Same as druggies. And by the way, much of this, in fact, the majority of this, is taken along with drugs. It is taught in Hinduism that you take drugs. They are lying to you when they say and they do not. There are many, back in the 60s, uh, bald-headed and wearing orange robes, used to hang out at airports until they finally threw them out uh, from the Hare Krishna movement. 
these guys were basically kidnapped teenagers, Europeans, Westerners, and mostly uh, runaway kids and America, uh, American. And uh, they were deprived of sleep, of food. They were sexually molested. They had to go and uh, be prostituted out. They had to steal weapons and murders involved. This is what Hinduism does. This is not me. This is facts that I've researched that are already out there in the courts and in the world. It is not about meditation and a happy-go-lucky afterlife because you found yourself somehow. The whole thing is criminal. All this togetherness has big problems. Unless there is one truth holy and separated from all the rest, we have, we're dealing with a perversion. Some truth may be fact. Remember, facts are bits of truth. But the total truth never changes. The total truth is eternal. It has nothing to do in this world except how the Lord God, in his word, described it to us. These meditation techniques are sold as naturally curing you. If you get into yourself, you can be naturally cured. You get in touch with that inner, what's really a serpent spirit, the kundalini force. And when you, that's what everybody's seeking. They're seeking contact with God. This is why it's so evil. Uh, people like Beth Moore, the total false teacher, talking about the, you know, seeking his presence. That's what this is. Walk in the labyrinth. You're seeking God. You want to have God right there. And if he's not right there, then he can't be real to you. This whole experiential nonsense. Well, where does that leave faith? Well, it throws it out the door. Remember what Jesus said to Doubting Thomas. It's great that you believe because you've seen me and you're touching me. You're, you know the wounds are here. You know it's me. And that's great, Thomas. However, blessed, favored of God in the highest is really what that means when he put it all together. Blessed is he who believes and has not seen, who has not experienced me like face to face. Because faith means that much to God. Your trust in him means that much to God. They've sold this mess as being non-religious, but of course it is full of religion. It is, in fact, Hinduism is the oldest organized religious system that came straight out of Babylon after the flood. We can check this one. We can regress in the history of, of, of Hinduism and go all the way back to the Babylonian religions. They all tie in together. Remember, there's no yoga without Hinduism and no Hinduism without yoga. And this non-religious perception has got to stop. It has been sold. In fact, they didn't get much of anywhere. And then when uh, Maharishi Yoga, one of, the, one of the Beatles, you know, was into them. In fact, all of them at one time. And uh, they decided to design a whole new system and sell it as, you know, uh, anti-stress techniques. That's why today you have yoga in churches all over the place. They're practicing yoga. They're teaching Hinduism. They got the kundalini fiery serpent who is Satan in their very building. And they don't know it. This is part of the apostasy. Those leaving the faith, they're falling from the faith on their own volition. If you think of this as modern and scientific then we can do it because we don't want religion. We don't want something that's antiquated. In other words, we don't want a God to tell us that there is sin. I don't want to have any sin. I don't want to owe God anything. I don't want to owe you anything. I only want to owe myself the pleasure of living. I want to party hardy, get all I can, take care of number one, and then when my life is over, I'll go to sleep, and there's nothing afterwards. And if there is something afterwards then I want it to be heaven for me. And God says, that's all great, those thoughts, and I'll even grant them, but you've got to believe me. <laughs> 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 
And in order to believe me, you got to understand that I exist. You got to know that I am the one who makes rules. There has to be rules. Aren't there rules in the universe? Doesn't the sun it do what it, it does? What do, doesn't the sun do what it does? Don't the planets revolve around the sun, etc.? Don't the birds find the the worms and bugs and stuff in the morning? Early worm gets the or the early bird gets the worm, right? Doesn't rain have to be taken up into the atmosphere, our first heaven atmosphere from the oceans? And when the conditions are right, hot, cold, and all that, pressure, form clouds. And what happens? The clouds go over the land and they drop rain, early rain, latter rain. We're experiencing some of the early rain, spring rains, fall rains, early and latter. God designed all that so that crops could grow. And not only that, he rains on the just and the unjust. He lets crops grow on the saved and the unsaved, on the believers and the unbelievers, because he wants the unbelievers to believe and know and trust him that, yes, he sent the rain. That's why I have, can make bread. That's why I can grow grain. Hallelujah. And yet we say, oh, no, it's our scientists who grow grain. And, of course, Monsanto and other evil outfits like that who have uh, injected so much trash in what used to be food uh, would, uh, would say yes to that. As long as you think of yourself as scientific and modern, then you're somebody cool. And you got to remember this. These thoughts were already going on in the day Jesus walked the earth and way before. Nothing is new, folks. Solomon said it. Nothing is new under the sun. What once was is again. So we see that being old and outdated wasn't really the problem. Rather, it was being held to a standard of right and wrong from God that was and unfortunately still is the problem. Allow yourself to be subject under God, I pray. Don't seek your own way without his wisdom. Now today they're pushing this meditation, this Eastern worthless meditation as being mindful but the truth is, the main idea is to get your mind emptied. And the, the, what they say is, well, get your mind emptied of all needless thoughts. And they say that as if they have control over the thoughts that come, and we do not. We do not make up the thoughts. We only decide which thoughts we're going to play with. Thoughts of spirit. And every one of you has millions of thoughts coming to you every single day. That's a lot of cleaning up if you're going to empty it. God doesn't want our heads to be empty. There's a reason why we have sayings like empty-headed fool. Have you lost your mind? They got rocks in their heads. Scatterbrain. <laughs> Not playing with a full deck. You got to screw loose. <laughs> In many more terms. Because the mind is not supposed to be empty. It's also not supposed to be full of a bunch of trash. The Word of God says, Take every thought captive and check it with my word, which I've given you, and it's been written. And if it lines up with this, go with it. Follow the thought. If it doesn't line up with this, immediately dump it. Don't let it concern you anymore. Don't play with it. Don't wonder what if, could have, would have, should have, any of that. That's the biblical teaching on thoughts. Obviously, an empty mind is correctly understood by one and all as undesirable. We know an empty mind is no good. We even make uh, sayings that I just read to you. And yet when this notion comes, because it's peddled by Eastern mysticism, it's supposed to be something positive, mysterious. See, when it's mysterious, we kind of want it. You can sell anything if you put secret in front of it. It's a secret. 
Because then, okay, what is it? I'm willing to pay you so much for the secret. I'm willing to spend so much time of my life to find the secret from you. I'll sign over my riches to some to get the secret that they have because they have a secret to life. And the secret really that they're trying to sell is everlasting life. The one that God gives totally free. <laughs> Ow! I'm telling you, people are stupid. <coughs> Any and all of this nonsense about having scientific proof that the sages of old knew is really just religion. It was denounced by the Bible, which they call stiff, judgmental, and outdated. Why aren't there sages with long beards who've lived in a, on a mountain for hundreds of years? Why isn't that guy outdated? You know, crooked long fingernails and wispy beard. And, and of course, if you're not Oriental, then you're not a real sage. All this stuff was sold. It came through martial arts. It came through uh, the music with the Beatles. It came in many ways. And if you scientific, or put a scientific connotation on it, people will buy it. Why? Because of the Age of Enlightenment that said, hey, we're now scientists. We now know how it rains and why it rains. Yeah, maybe you know why it rains. Well, there's a rain cloud. People have known that forever. You don't need to be a scientist. But how do you get the water from the oceans to the sky, do a travel, and dump it on the land? How do you do that? No man can do that. How many times are the weather guys right? <laughs> That's a joke in everybody's mind. We know this. They guess at the weather. Of course, now, thanks to Friedrich Nietzsche and his acclamation that God, the God of the Bible, that is, is dead, people have jumped on that particular bandwagon. And others have made the same proclamation. God, he said, was only alive and was an invention of those who were illiterate and therefore ignorant, simple-minded twits. Nietzsche was very intelligent. He was offered the head chair of a university in like his early 20s. He played the piano. You know, he had spoke several languages, uh, very well read, and none of that helped him in his intelligence because he was dumber than a box of rocks. He did not know the truth. He in fact denied the truth. And I've told you about him before. He's the guy that died in his late 40s, middle 40s, on a street in Turin, Italy. Crazy and sick, crapping all over himself, puking all over himself and could do nothing about it. His mind went crazy. This intelligent human being that people today study and emulate. This man that said God is dead. His sister had to change his diapers for eight or ten years after he collapsed in the street before he died. I think God got his payback. What about you? It's crazy. The guy was an imbecile idiot, as all these knuckleheads are. I can't stand it. And to revere these people, to study them like they have something to say that we can actually use? Are you kidding me? Regarding her first meditation, experienced former mystic Christine Pack says this, and I quote, in the space of 20 minutes, because that's all it takes to do meditation, my worldview shifted dramatically. The Christianity of the Bible was no longer a valid spiritual path for me. Why? Because Christianity is the only religion with such unbending and exclusive truth claims. As John 14, 6, I am the truth, the way, and the life. And meditation counters this claim by generating an experience in which a person feels a profound sense of interconnectedness and oneness with all that feels completely 
counter to the exclusive claims of Christianity. It feels like you just had an encounter with God that you have been in the presence of the divine, only you haven't. Let's look at the logical conclusions that practicing mystics must come to if they are staying true to their belief system. If I can experience God through meditation, if I can cross the divide through my own efforts, then the cross of Calvary has no meaning. And Jesus was a liar when he said that he was the only way to God. And the Bible was wrong where it says that Christ, or without Christ, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. No divine inner spark already living within each person, close quote. That's an eclectic, you know. That's about to go out unless we seek God, and God can light that thing back up and give you that life. Because we are dead in our trespasses. The Bible is clear. But it's not the end of the road because he said, here's salvation. If we were dead, then the salvation wouldn't work. Okay? There has to be a life of God in his creation that says yes to him at some point. <clears throat> and that is a powerful and true account of the dangerous position one puts themselves if one you know, plays with these contemplative Eastern practices which ends up in meditation. Their prayer is meditation. Meditation is prayer, they would say, but it's not the same. There is biblical meditation. It's meditating on God's Word. It's studying His Word. It's contemplating, God, what do you mean by this? And it's not, hmm, um, hum, 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 you know, whatever nonsense. Go on for 20 minutes and act like I, I had some kind of experience. It's ridiculous. People are stupid. Is that the first time I've ever said that? I hope it's never the last until Jesus comes. Don't have any fear at all of thinking and knowing that people who don't know God, and by knowing God, we're talking intimately knowing God. When you know God, God knows you. And that's intimate, it's relationship. Like when Jesus said, I never knew you to the five virgins who were unwise. Or well, they had the oil, they just didn't have enough. And they came knocking after it was too late. I know I'm late, but come on, five minutes, you know. Jesus says, get lost, I never knew you. We never had a relationship. You were playing a game. I am truth, I told you the truth, yet you played with that. And you allowed yourself to play a game. I never knew you. <laughs> Door goes shut. Wow. Emergent church advocates and even ever popular false teacher Beth Moore advocates this above all other teachings. Seeking his presence is almost her trademark. Others teach it too, but it's almost her trademark. And she gets these women in there, and these well-meaning, true-believing women go to her seminars and study her Bible studies. They buy the books, and they go at home, and they read this nonsense, and they think they're reading Scripture. It's not Scripture. It's crap. Absolute and total crap. You can take the pages of her books and whatever else she writes and go to the toilet with it. I want to be graphic because I want you to never leave here or any, anything I've ever taught and not know that this is crap to the max. It's not something you can clean up because it's evil. That's why. Completely evil. She's one of many. What Second John say, if anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this gospel, how Jesus lived and died on the cross and rose again the third day, etc. If they don't bring that in that simplicity, if they bring that, oh, you can meet God, you can see him face to face, you know. And all this nonsense, all you got to do is do this, 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 and this. Buy my book, da, da, da. No. Don't even bid him goodbye. So more information is surfacing about the dangers of these meditations where centers have been created to help individuals, actually, who followed or allowed themselves to be so duped. Physical illness like the body stopping to digest food, like happened to a 25-year-old yoga instructor, certified yoga instructor. His name was Michael. He arrived at the Britain Cheetah House to recover from demonic effects of Eastern meditation practice. 
more and more and more people are seeking to recover from this trash. It's finally coming out. This is demonic. And there are those who practice yoga and they just go on, drink their milkshake and go play a game and, and never experience this. But the ones that get serious with it always do. But all of it is playing a game with that. What good is something if you know you need to be over here, you know it. And you allow something over here to keep you from getting there. What good is it? Cut that thing and free yourself and go to the truth. Others had visions of death and suicide with thoughts like, let me take over you. Because this is demonic. 27-year-old David had this. This is traumatic. It takes these people months or years to get away from this. It's like detoxing anybody. You don't just detox in one time or one treatment or, you know, because they spend years, decades in some cases, getting trashed and then you can't expect to be cleaned up just like that. You can get saved just like that. Just like when Christ comes back, he's going to speak the word and Armageddon is over. But then there'll be a certain period of cleanup on the earth. Could he speak the word and clean it up? Of course. But then we wouldn't have a part in it. <laughs> you see, we need to be a part of this. Hallelujah. Something called the Dark Night Project has been launched uh, by Dr. Britton. Come on. He's a, uh, this person is an assistant professor of psychiatry and human behavior at the Brown University Medical School. And uh, she receives regular phone calls and emails and letters from people around the world in various states of impairment. She admits, and I quote, there are some parts of me that just want meditation to be all good. She's not a Christian. She's a psychobabbler. But here's what she said. There are some parts of me that just want meditation to be all good. I find myself in denial sometimes where I just want to forget all that I've learned and go back to seeing happy or being happy about mindful, mindfulness and promoting it. But then I meet someone who's in distress and I see the devastation in their eyes. And I can't deny that this is happening, close quote. She wants meditation to be everything she thought it was. Free myself, you know, find my inner spirit and all this. Be in touch with the cosmic Christ. But then I see people who do this come back with big problems. And I can't deny it, she says. Wow. You know, Dave Hunt and T.A. McMahon published their book in 206 called Yoga and the Body of Christ, and they reported at that time about 586,000 references could be found on Google under the heading Yoga for Christians. And it's basically 10 years ago. The same search now brings up over a million. So it's doubled. I remember just a few years ago, just came to mind, just, I was looking for jeans or workout shorts or something, I was at Target, and there were posters, you know, in the missus department and the boys and the young men and all this. Posters everywhere of young men and women in yoga positions, you know, wearing the tops or the pants or whatever they were selling in the department. And it said yoga under some. It said other Hindu references uh, on other parts of the poster, all over the stores. And it wasn't the only store. It's everywhere, everywhere you go. You guys have already been touched with yoga and Hinduism many times. Probably un, unknowingly, and thank God keep it that way, except for knowing to discern. You understand what I'm saying? The fact that the enemy doubled his sources in 10 years to cause people to suffer needless spiritual deception, oppression, and surely not a few demonic possessions along the way ought to sound the alarm but guess what it doesn't we heard it yesterday from Brandon House and those guys we went to the elders and I went to see that and uh, a lot of good stuff in there and you all have heard it I've preached it forever uh, everything they said and uh, it hadn't changed it hadn't changed 
I know that eternity will tell who's who and what's what. Final. We already know because God has said it and God can't lie. But then there'll be no, no getting out of it. And I hope that everyone who's ever heard my preaching has made a decision for Christ and will be in heaven. Hallelujah. Evangelical Youth Conferences have started their days with yoga practice as a matter of course. It's an everyday thing. This is why even back when, when uh, some of our older kids now who are married and have children, when they were teenagers and went to youth groups, I was warning back then, be very careful. Every college, you know, so-called Christian organization has already been infected for the last 30, 40, 50 years through the same kind of garbage. It's all coming together. A writer for Christianity uh, Today magazine, which is one of Billy Graham's 12 or 15 publications, Total Trash, it's a pagan magazine, but it's called Christianity Today, and a writer for this magazine says yes to yoga. She claims, and I quote, the three hours a week I spend doing yoga not only make me more flexible, tone my muscles and relax me, they also draw me closer to Christ. They are my bodily kinetic prayer, close quote. And of course, a slew of these professing Christians practice a variety of yoga, such as Jesus yoga, Yahweh yoga, holy yoga, kids holy yoga, praise moves, yoga faith, and Christ yoga, just to mention a few. See how they come up with all these? These things didn't exist, uh, you know, three or four or five decades ago. These names didn't exist. The idea that because Christians knew better, said, Th this stuff is not good. But everybody's now, you know, jumping on this bandwagon. Part of the apostasy, folks. Apostasy, the great falling away from the faith. Don't you be part of that. On their collective website, the ones I just mentioned, they make this comment, and I quote, what's this sound like? Listen up. We are drawn together through our individual and collective experience that yoga and meditation deepens our Christian faith. We simply feel called to share our experiences with the hope they'll draw others to deepen their faith through embodied contemplative practices, meaning seeking His presence, being with God, or thinking they are. Some devil comes along as an angel of light, and they think, oh, it's God, you know, this kind of nonsense. But this, right here is clear. They're going to deepen their faith. How does God say faith comes? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It doesn't come by meditation. It doesn't come by any of that unless it's meditation in the Word of God. The Christian Yoga Magazine web uh, website advertises to be a resource, quote, for all people of all religious traditions to explore how they can integrate Eastern physical and spiritual practices such as yoga, meditation, and Tai Chi into their lives while remaining true to their deepest spiritual beliefs. Right there, I mean, they're not even Christian, but they call themselves that. <sighs> uh, if I told you I was a teenager, what would you think? Yeah, but you young ones, what would you think? <laughs> Inside, you know, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> There's no way. Look at him. He ain't got no more hair. <laughs> His belly's out here. What's if I was really serious? What's if I said, listen, I'm a teenager. I met with God yesterday. I asked him to be sure. And he said, of course you are. Would that make me a teenager? Of course not. Something similar to that idiotic example is what people literally do when they get into this stuff. Do you hear me? It is unbelievably stupid. But that's where they go. By their own volition, by the way, they will to do this. Of course, the quotes I just gave you are from total unbelieving pagans, pagan twits. See, they assume they're already close to God. They are, in fact, strangers to him because he doesn't know them at all. 
And again, the word know, never forget it, is intimate, personal relationship knowledge. The same word know that's translated know is the word for marital sex because it's intimate, it's personal. You can't get any more intimate. That's how God needs to know us and we need to know him or there is no Christianity between you and he. It's a personal relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and an individual. That's what Christianity is. How many times have I said it? Once, twice. I'm going to say it more because I tell you what, the world is eating us up or trying to. And they're getting chunks of people I used to listen to. And yesterday they mentioned some of them. David Jeremiah, phew, he's gone. Big guy on the radio, had some good teachings. Years and I used to wake up, the radio would kick on. And he would come on. His teachings would come on. Good teachings. Then he started at some point, some years ago, he started using the, the, the pagan book, The Message. And I knew this guy has fallen. And once you fall, there's no coming back. Remember, wrong teachings lead to false teachings, lead to heresy. Wrong worship leads to false worship, leads to idolatry. And every subject goes downward like that unless it stops somewhere. But usually once you get to the middle one, there is no stopping. You're done. Because you think you know. Especially if you had an experience. Listen, if any one of you walked some sort of labyrinth and you were really into it, you know, oh Lord, I'm seeking you all. Oh, please show yourself, blah, 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 blah. And something shows, shows, shows itself to you in, in your head or however you think it comes and you really believe you, you, you saw God, you had an encounter with God. How, what is my witness to you? Nothing. You can say, well, have you seen God? I'd have to say, well, no. But the Bible says I won't. <laughs> You know what, when God comes to people in dreams, and he does, he comes in hard places, like the persecuted church. They need that. And when he comes with them, it's real. Wow. So deception and the lie comes by disregarding God's word and accepting demonic influences in our lives. And these influences are all around us. Biblical discernment demands adherence to the scriptures, thus submitting to God. Then and only then will the devil flee, James 4, 17. Now, I want to, this is a Gary Kaz newsletter that uh, we get. And Carl Teichrib, you remember Carl? He spoke uh, with us at the first conference. He and Gary, you remember him? Well, he's the editor of this. And he always has a, uh, an article and this month or this quarter visiting India in Utah the east evangelizing the west see people thought this was over they thought it was in the 60s and the 70s and then they went away they didn't go away I had a pastor tell me that oh I thought the word of faith people they kind of went away <laughs> they're bigger than ever their planes, their personal private planes are bigger. Their headquarters all over the world on every single continent are bigger. Why? Because Antichrist system is being raised up. And so in Utah, you know who controls Utah? The Mormons. They control the whole state, politically and otherwise. Yet in Utah, this temple, I know it's hard to see, it's a great big huge temple. A Hindu temple was built in Utah. Carl goes there. Carl Tykrib, the guy, you know, our friend from Canada. And he interviews this guy. When you came in, the smells and sights caught your attention, yes? Yes, I answered. This is Paul, or, or, or uh, Carl saying, yes, I answered. The food was very tasty. After a second helping of sock paneer, a wonderful Indian dish made of spinach and paneer cheese, the guru had me sit <coughs> excuse me, the guru had me sit down for a talk. His wife and assistant joined us and others filtered in and out of the conversation. Why here? Why Utah? I asked. Krishna directed us to this place, the, te the Hindu teacher said. Krishna is the Hindu Christ. Because there is no such person, you understand. Uh, I knew there was more to the story than simply Krishna directed, but as my time was limited and my host's English was difficult to follow, I listened more than I asked, Paul, or Carl says. 
Since 1998, the Sri Lanka Radha Krishna Temple, also known as the Lotus Temple, has been a landmark in the predominantly Mormon community of Spanish Fork, Utah. Located approximately 50 miles south of Salt Lake City, the temple is comprised of gleaming white domes over 100 arches and columns and grand outdoor staircase and a spacious upper-level walk-around patio. This edifice set against the mountain backdrop of central Utah is visible from Interstate 15. Established as part of the ISKCON network, that is the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, also known as the Hare Krishna movement, the ones who, were, who got kicked out of the airports, the ones who were kidnapping teenagers I told you about, getting them drugged up and drunk and selling them as, as whores and, and having them steal things and shoot people and stealing guns and all kinds of stuff. This is evil. All to make money, 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 money. So the Hare Krishna movement. And by the way, uh, I've said this before too, but by way of reminder, you know, George Harrison of the Beatles, you know, when he came up with it, he was big into this. He thought that Jesus Christ and Hare Krishna was the same. And so he wrote a song, became a huge hit, My Sweet Lord. Oh, my Lord, my sweet Lord. And then there he has, uh, I really want to be with you. And in the background, Hare, Hare. You see, that's what this is. And then he uses the word Hallelujah, because he's marrying. He's marrying Hinduism with Christianity in this song, and the world loved it. It's a catchy tune. I used to sing it until I understood what it meant. And you kids have no idea when I say the Beatles what that means. When I was your age, in fact, a little younger, your age, the Beatles became for you, what, 13? <laughs> I apologize. All right, I'm not your age either. You, I said earlier, you guys are like, <laughs> uh, when I was about 9 or 10 or 11, I get, I didn't, I knew you weren't that. <laughs> uh, Back in Germany, growing up, the Beatles were huge. Of course, they they played in Germany a lot. They were they playing in the in the in the in all the punk leather and you know all that, in the in Hamburg and in uh, Bremen and other cities like that. So they were already popular, in in a subculture. Okay, but then somebody made them really popular and they became a huge hit. No one has ever been that big at that time in the world. Okay, even Frank Sinatra, who was even before my time. Uh, has has had as many record sales, but he was never that big because by the time the Beatles came around, 1966, 65, 64, that era, technology and the media was much bigger. Television was much bigger than in the 30s and 40s, you understand? So, And just like now, now we have cell phones, so it's even bigger than that. There are a lot of Hollywood stars I've never even heard of, yet everybody in the world seems to know who they are. I have no clue who they are because of technology. All right, so we have this going on, okay? And so Hinduism used this. Anyway, so when I say uh, George Harrison of the Beatles, I mean someone whom the, everyone in the world knows and was crazy about. The girls would go, ah! you know, at concerts. You couldn't even hear the music, literally. I mean, crazy. It was called the British Invasion because you had the Beatles, you had the Rolling Stones, you had, you know, Led Zeppelin, everybody else like that came. And it was, most of them were, were British that came over. And then uh, with, along with our local guys like Elvis and some other bands that were local, uh, it was a huge, 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 huge movement that became the hippie movement. You guys have heard of that probably. It was all, all had to do with music. All had to do with, you know, tuning out, getting high. Hanging out, listening to music. Wow, man. <laughs> you know, all this flower child garbage. I was part of that. So this Lotus Temple, spiritual heritage, is built around the teachings of A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Prabhu Bapada. He lived from 1896 to 1977. 39 other ISKCON temples and Vedic centers Vedic as in the, the, uh, the Hindu Vedas, it's a Hindu holy writings, okay? Uh, 39 other temples dot the United States, each one advancing the mission of Prahupada. You guys worried about mosques? This is the same. Same danger. 
Noted for his tremendous influence upon Western culture and his voluminous writings, Swami Prabhupada's message was one of religious universalism and conscious transformation. Quit thinking Christian. Quit thinking that you're saved by Christ. Quit thinking Bible. Quit thinking the God of the Bible. Let's all get together. Like the crap I just read you. I choose to call it that because I want to be succinct and not misunderstood. These are not bad teachings. These are not even just false teachings. This is evil crap. Get it in your head. The main point is to follow the injunctions of the Vedic scriptures, the Hindu Vedas. They recommend chanting the name of God in this age. The name chanted is Krishna, the avatar of the Hindu god Vishnu. Remember, avatar is, uh, means as much as savior. That's why the movie Avatar, however technologically cool it may have been, is evil because it was pushing Hinduism. The movie Gandhi, where they were trying to make Gandhi out to be some hero. Gandhi was just like the popes and all the rest of them, a liar, a murderer, a pedophile. He was a scum bucket. He was no wonderful guy who starved for the sick. He was a murderer. He had no problems murdering Africans in the 1920s in the Boer Wars. He had no trouble with that. I'm sick of all these people being called heroes. They're scum. That's right, scum. <laughs> In repeating the Hare Krishna mantra and through the practice of bhakti yoga, the follow, embra the, the follow embraces as a unity of religions. Prabhupada said in this way, quote, his own words, to practice bhakti yoga, and he called that loving service to God, means to become free from designations like Hindu, Muslim, Christian, this or that, and simply to serve God. See, isn't that sweet? Isn't that what you want? Forget about all that stuff. Forget, ah, forget about it. <laughs> what do you want me to do, Don Corleone? Ah, forget about it. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't resist that. See, I'm the king of fun, I tell you. <laughs> so we don't want to be uh, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, this or that, simply to serve God. We have created Christian, Hindu, uh, and Mohammedan religions, but when we come to a religion without designations in which we don't think we are Hindus or Christians or Mohammedans, then we can speak of pure religion or bhakti. Wow, oh, you're so holy. Oh, I didn't know that. I can now go really sleep and pee. <laughs> uh. Carl goes on, while I was at the Lotus Temple, the resident teacher explained to me how Hinduism has been evangelizing the West through yoga and the holy festival of colors. Holy is not like Bible holy, okay? This is different with an I. Now, it'll become, make more sense in a minute. The practice of yoga has certainly gone mainstream, as one Hindu source explains, quote, yoga is the largest practice religion today in the world. Holi is less, is less well known, but the festival has its variant offshoots have gained in popularity over the past five years, especially with the millennium generation. That's today's teenagers. Don't let it be you guys. Remember when Carl taught about all those festivals, you know, the Burning Man and all of that? This is part of it. Holi is a springtime celebration of good over evil and the triumph of devotion as depicted through the Hindu legend of Holika, and this is why it's shortened to holy. So it's not like holy God, okay? The wife of a demon king and her interaction with Krishna. Another side of the celebration is the legend of Krishna and the goddess Radha, wherein Krishna is given permission to color Radha. To color Radha. Now listen to this. Besides the Spanish Fork location, Holi is now celebrated in major cities across America and the experience has been culturally leveraged through the hugely popular 5K color runs or Color Me Rad. You've seen those t-shirts? It's Hinduism. Who knows it's Hinduism? Nobody. But it is. Does it matter if you know or not? No, because it still is. If I flip a speck or something that hits your sweater and you don't know what it is. Does it matter what it is? 
Well, it should, because it could be poop. Of course, I'd have to have a glove on. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? You better know what's on you. The discernment that we're commanded to, to have. God's given us everything we need for discerning correctly. Color me rad. More often than, th than not, participants in these color events are unaware of the Hindu connection. For in many cases, the religious aspect is buried, ignored, or stripped of context. But that doesn't make it powerless. That doesn't make the Kundalini serpent demon force powerless. You know, in fact, it makes them more powerful. Why? They're hidden. If I come to you this way, you know, as long as I'm like this, I'm pretty much hidden, right? Well, who's shooting at you? I don't know. I don't know. Partial, you know, I don't know what it is. You see what I'm saying? What's more powerful for me, to be here or to be here? If I want your mind, it's more powerful for me to be here, isn't it? The only way I'm going to do this is before I do this, I'm going to put the light on me and look like a shining angel. Now I can go. You see the difference? Now, because it's been stripped of the context and so on, it angers some Hindus. See, the real deep Hindus that really are into it, they're angered by this. Just like the real Muslims are angered by those who are so-called modern Muslims. That's why ISIS kills Muslims, because they're moderate. In their eyes, they're not really Muslims. And guess what? They're not. Not according to the Quran. If you're a Muslim who thinks you can play with a Hindu and do with other and act like Christians are your friends, you're not a Muslim. You may think you are. You may even believe you are, but you're not. That yoga promotes Hinduism is relatively easy to understand as the two are in intrinsically linked. Remember, there's no yoga without Hinduism, no Hinduism without yoga. But how do color runs and the Western embrace of the holy festival advance Hinduism? By providing an exciting and vibrant experience that promotes social acceptance of Eastern customs and by extension, implicitly or explicitly, Eastern spirituality. You're going to accept, if you accept one area, you're going to accept the rest. If you go into an Indian restaurant, uh, you know, to want to experience Indian food, nothing wrong with that. But if your thoughts at seeing the statues around the restaurant and the decor, which is all Hinduism, and you give that any kind of play at all, then you may have a problem. And you've got to be very careful. It's true that the Hindu element can sometimes be overshadowed in Western color celebrations, especially the 5K runs, which are typically advertised as community party. You see? They're not saying, come to the Hindu party. Probably nobody would come, or very few. But they're coming to them. By the way, this picture has thousands of people. This is once a year in, in Utah. And you know who, um, who, who uh, well, many of these people are? Mormons. Mormon teenagers, Mormon kids. The Mormon church has made a deal with Hinduism or they would not be in this state. You understand? One devil outfit made a deal with another devil outfit on a large scale. And they're building these temples everywhere. Wow. In fact, you guys have a Mormon temple just a few blocks from your house. And I didn't think it was. And Jill thought she saw it. And we went by there, you know, after we talked about it. And sure enough, Church of the Latter-day Saints of, of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, blah, blah, blah. And on the bottom, it has everyone welcome. What? That's a new thing. You know, within the last 10 years or so, it's a new thing. It's done so that people accept Mormonism. It's done so that other Christians can say, oh, they're Mormons. We're Christians. We're Baptists. And they're also Christians except for they're Mormons. That's what this is about. And they're not. Just a few blocks from your house there on whatever that road is. No, we, we, we go the back way now. You know, we leave you. We, we, turn, we turn left, go up the hill there where that lake is, or your house. You know, the water right there. We go out that way. Yeah, 450 is it? Okay. And you go left a uh, quarter mile or less, and there's a temple right there, Mormon temple. Everyone welcome. 
All right, let me con conclude this. Oh, we got plenty of time, right? We don't have to be out here till when? All right, plenty of time. All right, it's true that the holy element sometimes be overshadowed, da da da, 5K runs. Uh, however, the Holy Festival of Colors at Lotus Temple vigorously promotes Eastern spirituality. Krishna is front and center. See, in events like this, they don't have to hide anymore. People are willingly coming to them. As long as you come to me, see, if I knock on your door, I got to go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really a person of God. I'd love for you to be saved like I'm saved. Da, 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 da. I may be a total pagan. In fact, I will be if I knock on your door like that. You know, strangers' doors, because I want you guys. And so if I have you, I have your money, I have your soul, I have everything I need to build this thing. And I get brownie points, and they raise me up on the ladder. You know, this is how it goes. Uh, but when you, that's me coming to you. But when you come to me, I already got you. I can tell you anything I want. I can tell you, because when you make up your mind to come to one of these pagan events, you are already on their radar and in their book. Each spring, thousands of people flock to the Lotus Temple for the color event billed as the largest holy, holy in the uh, United States. In 2015, approximately 65,000 people uh, converged for three days of music, yoga, and celebration. It's always that. It's always music, celebration, music, celebration, and the trash in the middle. Music, celebration, music, and the trash in the middle. This is why I, I come to, to uh, all this. The Christians were trying to do the same thing. Oh, come on, everything's free, free hot dogs, free potato chips, free food. We give you music, you know, and then they want to do all this Christian rock and roll business. And then they give a little message and they hope to save people. It won't work that way if you're not looking for Christ. If these people come in there to get their free food aren't looking for Christ, they're not getting saved. <laughs> I don't care how much money you spend. It's, it's like this. They're getting entertained, but they're not getting saved. So, Walt, is there something wrong with those? No. But it doesn't serve the purpose. It can never get the point that the reason why they do it, which is to get people saved. That's what they say. They want to evangelize. You can't evangelize until somebody wants to be evangelized. Fires burned in remembrance of Holika. Bhakti music and DJs energized the crowd. Notice they energized the crowd, got them all going. Here they're all dancing. You know, it's no different going to a rock concert. You know, been to some of those myself, except for this now. I never went into that when I was young. Colors were tossed in the air and upon each other, and the multitude chanted the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. This is what they do over and over and over again. They dance, they get all crazy, they do dope, they do everything else, and they think they met God. That's what this is. They will witness, these people will say, we had an encounter with God on some level. Since the Holy Festival began at Spanish Fork, the majority attending have not been devotees of the Hindu religion. They just come to party. Same devil that they're dancing with, you understand. But they've been Mormons, as he says here. And the Mormon interest extends beyond the Holy Fest. It's about Antichrist system building. How many times have you heard me say it? Every Sunday, the Lotus Teacher explained to me, 100 to 150 Mormons come to the temple for yoga and the Maha Mantra. This is Mormons. Mormonism has nothing in common with Hinduism except they're both of the devil. You understand? <laughs> I was a little taken aback by this, and yet I wasn't wholly surprised. The West was traditionally viewed Hinduism with the bounds of ethnicity and culture. Because of this, official conversion to the Vedic faith isn't a significant factor in North America or in Europe, although it happens. Rather, the shift comes through the social acceptance of the Hindu worldview and its message of spiritual living, packaged and sold through celebration and health, regardless of a person's belief system. See, you're not, the, going to this is not going to take my faith in Christ away, is what they're saying. I'm just joining with the rest of the group in the world, and I love people. This is a you know, demonstration of my love to y'all, love to mankind. Didn't Christ command us to love our neighbors? This is what they'll use. 
Well, yeah, he did, but he didn't mean this, obviously. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, What commonality is there between Jesus and Belial, or the devil? What does an unbeliever have in common with a believer? And he makes a few other examples, and he says, obviously nothing. <laughs> so don't hang out with them. In other words, the West is being Hinduized in, fa hin Hinduized in fact, but not necessarily in name. The bottom line, we as Christians need to recognize and understand the scope and range of the Eastern influence. It has evangelized us. Uh, and now we need to respond to the uh, with the truth and love of Jesus, with the truth and love of the real Jesus Christ, first to the Christian community that has that has accepted the Eastern perspective, and then to the culture around us. And of course, uh, never under, never forget that the world. I've harped on this before. Let me do it again. And I got something else. I'm not done yet. Are you still here? Yeah. <laughs> The world thinks that when Christ's love is like he's going to come and bring candies and flour to you. That's what the world thinks Christ's love is. And that's not what it is. It's much deeper than that. He sacrificed himself for the world. But he will not, under any circumstances, put up with sin, period. And that's the justice that must go along with love. I've preached it a million times. This is an article by Michael Snyder. Uh, one world religion meeting God in different ways. See, it's just saying the same thing that these guys, and the same thing here, and the same thing I've been preaching for the last 20 years, and the same thing we heard yesterday from Brandon House and everybody. Yeah. The real Christians have got to hear this and hear this so that the real people stay real. Some of us will fall, not us in here. It was very obvious to me yesterday that out of maybe the, I don't know, 300 people, 400 people in the room, something like that, the majority had no clue. A lot of elderly, and I heard a few, and, ah, when he was saying things that we you guys already know because I've been harping it. I mean, that's just the way it is. People don't know. They're ignorant. So when their grandchildren get into this and they come home and they tell grandma all about this this fun fest and we threw colored cornstarch on us you know we had so much fun you know it's almost like you know shooting with a paintball you know it was, it was really fun and we were chanting hare 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 you know oh it was just fun grandma that's all it was the children rose up to play God told Moses when they did the golden calf they danced, and they partied, they drank, and they looked at that thing that they'd done, and they said, thank you, Jehovah, for getting us out of Egypt. And God said, get down there. Your people are sinning. I'm not putting up with this crap. There are many who would condemn me for using that word like I just did. But you know what I mean. I know what I mean. More important, God knows exactly why and how I mean it. And in that, I stand at peace. All right, so this new pope, there was quite a bit of talk yesterday about the pope, and I was already planning on doing this, so it was, it was right in line. Pope Francis is a knucklehead, and I don't mean in a funny way. He's an evil knucklehead. He's the dumbest pope the church has ever had, as far as I know. Ratzinger, probably the smartest ever had, because he was a scholar. He was the enforcer for the Catholics. He voluntarily stepped down. But he's buddies with this guy, as he was buddies with John Paul II. It's all the same devil, folks. You have the Bushes, you know, give us this. And then the Clinton gave us that, and somebody else would give us something else. All the same devil, all the same lie, all the same bullseye. We're going to the same place, no matter what anybody says, because it's an antichrist system that's being built. The only way we could argue that is if we didn't know a system is being built to counter us. But we know it because God says so. He said there'll be a great falling away from the faith, the truth, and in that, there'll be political 
upheaval, wars and rumors of wars everywhere. And it's going to end up in one great big ugly one where blood's going to flow as high as a horse's bridle. And when that happens, I'm coming down to stop it because if I don't, the whole thing would be gone and my creation would be totally wasted and I'm not having it. Remember, the earth is never going to cease. There's no such thing as the end of the world. There's only the end of the age. And this age is about to end. <coughs> they brought this up yesterday, of course, too. He says, uh, as Michael Snyder says, this new video, which uh, Pope's into video. This guy's into videos, by the way. The older Pope's weren't so much. Oh, there was film of them, but this guy's into videos because it reaches, you see. And the Pope says, while being from various global faith, maybe seeking God or meeting God in different ways, quote, it is important to keep in mind that we are all children of God. This is a mindless mantra, oh, we're all children of God. About, when I, when I got saved to about 25 some years ago, a friend of mine, actually the wife of a friend of mine, we, we played soccer together on a team, uh, had, a little, had a little booth in the mall, and I was witnessing to her because I just got saved. I was excited about telling everybody about Jesus, and I'd been already rejected by these people. In fact, her husband was Jewish, and he once told me, he said, Walt, I'm Jewish, like he doesn't need to be witnessed to. I said, that's exactly why you need it, Howard. You're deceived, dude. Good friend of mine. Otherwise, you know, we had a lot of fun. Um, played guitar and all that. Um, but anyway, so I'm talking to the wife. She was not Jewish, but a hippie all through and through. And uh, Jaron and their children were best friends. They hung out a lot and played soccer and all that together. So we were tight. You understand what I'm saying? And, uh, and I just witnessed to her and she goes, well, we're all children of God. That told me, okay, Walt, well, thanks, but no thanks. You know, it's a nice way of saying shut up. I don't want to hear anymore. I don't believe what you got to say. And her, the way to tell me to shut up was we're all children of God. That's what the Pope is saying. To all of those who are saying, no, Jesus is the only way. You need to be born again or you're not making it to heaven. You're going to the lake of fire for sure. And he's saying, oh, no, don't buy that lie. Buy our lie, you know. <laughs> And, of course, he's a knucklehead. Uh, the first ever video message on his monthly prayer intentions were released Tuesday, highlighting the importance of interreligious dialogue. Interreligious. Religion and religion. We can all be one. Remember that no two opposing thoughts can simultaneously be right. One of them has to be wrong. And if you have more than two, then a whole bunch has to be wrong because only one can be right. The importance of the religious dialogue and the beliefs differ, uh, different faith traditions hold in common, such as the figure of God in love. I hold the figure of God in love in common? They don't even know what love is. Many think differently, feel differently, seeking God or meeting God in different ways. This is this contemplative crap. This is this walk in the labyrinth. This is having a special personal encounter. I feel God. Remember I read you the, the quotes? You know, when I meditate 20 minutes, I feel this is the way it is. I feel, it's all about feelings. Which a person feels a profound sense of interconnectedness and oneness with all that feels completely counter to the exclusive claims of Christianity. It feels like you just had an encounter with God. Yeah, it all feels like it, but it didn't. Man. And this knucklehead has got a billion or two or three or billion and a half people that, that follow him. And so do the Muslims, by the way. They're real close. They claim almost two billion, but who knows. He says this, or many think and feel differently, seeking God da, 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 in different ways. Uh, in this crowd, in this range of religions, there's only one certainty that we have for all. We are all children of God. There he goes again. Pope Francis said in his message released on January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany. But it isn't just Pope Francis speaking in this video. In fact, one section features leaders from various global religions expressing faith in their respective deities. The following comes from an article about uh, the new video by a Christian news network. Is it Christian? No, it's just a news network. But they call themselves Christian. 
The video then features a clip of those of different, from different world religions declaring belief in their various deities. I have confidence in Buddha, a, f a female lama announces. I believe in God, a rabbi affirms. I believe in Jesus Christ, a priest states. I believe in Allah, an Islamic leader declares. Are you shocked yet? The Pope, will close the, the, <laughs> the Pope closes the video with an appeal for people from every religion to talk with one another and to work with one another, as the Catholic news agency writes, and I quote, Later on, after the Pope affirms that all, regardless of their religious profession, are children of God, the faith leaders state their common belief in love. You see the lie here? Oh, this is why I'm not a lover, according to them. My wife knows I'm a lover. My son knows I'm a lover. I think most of you do. <laughs> exactly. We all believe in love. Yet the world is arming itself to the teeth and murdering one another. Oh, we all believe in love. Pope Francis closes this video by expressing his hope that viewers will spread my, quote, spread my prayer request this month, that sincere dialogue among men and women of different faiths may produce fruits of peace and justice. I have confidence in your prayers. Well, they're not going any higher than the ceiling because this is trash. This is crap. Capital C, R A P P P P P P P P P <laughs> exclamation mark a thousand mark a thousand times after that. I hate this crap. It's ungodly, godless twit trash to the max. How dare somebody call it love or tell me I don't know love when I know the only one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is love. Hallelujah. Of course, this is not the time that the Pope, Pope Francis has done something like this. Very early in his papacy, he authorized, quote, Islamic prayers and readings from the Quran at the Vatican. Do you see what's going on here? That would not have been possible even in the least just a few decades ago. Couldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Nobody would have dared. He'd have been shot. The Vatican has its own army, its own bodyguards called the Swiss uh, Swiss guards, they wear the funny outfits, you know, that they wore hundreds of years ago, striped and bellowing out pants and, you know, sleeves and stuff like you've seen them, hat with, uh, yeah, plumes and stuff in it, you know, and carry a big spear and they stand there. You've seen the guys in, in, in London, you know, with the big black hat, stand motionlessly to guard the, the palace. Well, these guys do the same thing to the Vatican. And they're all trained, they're all trained soldiers, all many are special forces. All of them are Jesuits, every one of them. You cannot be there unless you're a Jesuit. And I've read you the Jesuit oath before, haven't I? How cruel it was. Throw babies' heads against the tree. All for the Pope, if that's what it needs to be. Cut the throats, kill them, poison them, however you got to do it, blow them up. That's what these guys believe, folks. Here's how the Pope began his address. Well, let me, let me go back to the, he authorized Islamic prayers and readings from the Quran at the Vatican for the first time ever. And during his visit to St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan, he comes to your country and mine here in the United States where we live. He made it very clear that, that he believes that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. The following is, is how he began his address. Quote, I would like to express two sentiments from my, for my Muslim... Mu I would like to express two sentiments for my Muslim brothers and sisters. Firstly, my greetings as they celebrate the Feast of Sacrifice. I would have wished, <laughs> I would have wished my greetings to be Voma. <laughs> my sentiments of closeness, my sentiments of, uh, yeah, my sentiments of closeness, my sentiments of closeness in the face of tragedy, the tragedy that they suffered in Mecca. Because there was a bomb went off, you know, when they all got together for the Hajj. In this moment, I give assurances of my prayers. I unite myself with you all, a prayer to Almighty God, all merciful. He's referred, with that all merciful, he's referring to Allah of the Quran, who is the devil. 
In Islam, one of Allah's primary titles is the Old Merciful One, and this certainly was not the first time Pope Francis had used such language. For example, check out the following excerpt from remarks he made during his first ecumenical meeting as Pope. And I quote, I then greet and cordially thank you all, dear friends, belonging to other religious traditions. First of all, to the Muslims, who worship the one God, living and merciful, and call upon him in prayer. And all of you, I really appreciate your presence. In it, I see a tangible sign of the will to grow in mutual esteem and cooperation for the common good of humanity. The Catholic Church is aware of the importance of promoting friendship and respect between men and women of different religious traditions. I wish to repeat this, promoting friendship and respect between men and women of different religious traditions. It also attests the valuable work that the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue performs, close quote. And Jesus said, what does the devil have in common with Jesus? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? He said, oh, we got everything in common. He go, he's going directly counter to the words of God himself. That's why this is evil crap. His words, that is. And the author here, Michael Snyder, says, Are you getting the picture? Pope Francis believes that all religions are different paths to the same God, and he's working hard to lay a foundation for the coming, uh, pre, or for the coming one world religion. And again, you know it's not coming, right? You know it's already here. It's just being perfected. It's being worked on. That's what all this is. Listen to this. However, there are some religious people that Pope Francis does not like. Just recently, he referred to Christian fundamentalism, and especially Walt Hartwich, as a sickness, <laughs> and made it clear that there was no room for it in Catholicism. <laughs> So precisely what is fundamentalism? Online, one online definition is a form of religion, especially Islam or Protestant Christianity, that upholds belief in the strict literal interpretation of Scripture. <laughs> Folks, if I had Scripture that I can play with and say, well, God says, in the beginning I created. And I said, well, I don't take that literally. I take that to mean whatever I want it to mean. What do I have? Nothing. Garbage. Total garbage. Wow. Does this mean the Pope is against Christians who believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible? That does appear to be what he's saying, and without a doubt, those would be the Christians that would be against the kind of one-world religion he appears to be promoting. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John warned us that a one-world religion was coming, and now we can see it coming to fruition. So what will the end result be of all this? Snyder is editor of the Economic Collapse, some magazine or something. You know, I talked to you quite a bit about finances and stuff, and I will continue to do that. In fact, we need to have a conference on finances because they're changing every day. And it's not that all of us are going to rush out and do these things. That's not the point. The point is to be aware so that, see, when you're aware, then you can make, it, make a, uh, a decision. Let's say you drive down the road at whatever speed. And you don't know what's coming, next, what's coming against you on the other side, if it's on the other side of the lane, <laughs> or who's next to you or who's behind you. I mean, if you really don't know these things, is there going to be an accident? Sooner or later, and probably sooner. You must have information. When one army has no information about the other army, these guys are in deep, deep trouble. They must have intel. God's given us intel right here. This is the intel of God. Who we are, how we got here, what we're doing here, and where we're going. That's what this is. Never forget it, guys. I can't, you know, only God's spirit can move on people's hearts and minds. I can only harp at you and yell at you and all the rest of it, and I'll be happy to do that. Uh, and if, if, I, if I could, I'd... Uh, uh, I'd rip out your beards if you needed it, like in Nehemiah, I love it. <laughs> God said, straighten these guys out in no uncertain terms, and Nehemiah said, to, said give them the command, and some of them didn't want to do it, he ripped their beards out. <laughs> it says, you ripped, Ur. get out of town, get out of this camp, because you're not with God. Either we're with them or we're not. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Father in heaven.
help us to expose more of this crap as it comes along. And I dare say that you use the very same word, only it's translated dung in many ways, <coughs> excuse me, in many ways in the Old Testament. That's how you looked at false teachers and fornication against you. Spiritual fornication is worthless, totally worthless. There is no value in, in that person. Even the value that remains in that person you will destroy in the lake of fire. Through the process of Apollumi, Lord. Wow. We, on the other hand, expect a crown of life. Because we believe your word, we believe your promise. And we fully expect to be raptured out of here because of your promise to us that we believe. We've done nothing on our own to earn it, but you've done all the work. Thank you for that, Lord. Forgive us all our sins and bless our next week and months and so on until you come. And may you come soon, Lord. May we hear that beautiful trumpet sound come up hither. And we'll meet you in the air. Forgive us our sins, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you.